Happy belated Fourth of July, everybody. This is my first time teaching since Jerry had this set up up here. All you need, Jerry, now is a couple of turntables, man. <laughs> and we'll be set, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, guys, turn with me, if you would, uh, to the uh, book of Luke, uh, the 12th chapter. Um, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3 and verses 42 through 43. As you turn that this, there this morning, uh, I want to start off with a short story that I heard recently, and it was sort of funny, so I'm going to uh, let you guys hear it, and you guys let me know what you think. It's a story about a cowboy, cowboy who had an unconventional way of teaching his horse commands to follow when he was riding him. When, when he wanted his horse to um, stop, he would simply say, hallelujah. And sure enough, the horse learned this command, and whenever he, the cowboy said it, the horse would immediately stop. When he wanted his horse to take off at a full gallop, he would simply say, praise the Lord. And sure enough, the horse would take off at a full gallop if he said, praise the Lord. One day, the cowboy was out riding with his horse on a leisurely stroll, and the horse was spooked by the sound of gunfire. So immediately, the horse took off at a full gallop. And the cowboy was doing everything in his power to try to stop his horse, but he couldn't do it. So he realized as the horse was going at a full gallop, that they were about to come uh, to a 45-foot cliff. And the cowboy became panicked. He said, God, what was the command? You know, he's thinking it over in his head. What was the command to make this horse stop? And he couldn't think of it. And then finally, within inches from this cliff, he remembered the command. And he said, hallelujah. And sure enough, the horse stopped right before he went over the cliff. The cowboy was relieved, he wiped his brow, and he said, praise the Lord. And the horse <laughs> took off and <laughs> took him and the cowboy over the cliff. Um, you know, that's a funny story, but the, the moral of that story is, don't ever let anyone tell you that words don't matter, because they do, especially the Word of God. The Bible says the grass withers, the, fade, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Let's pray, guys. My Father, as we prepare to get into your word this morning, we ask that you open our eyes, that you open our hearts and our ears, my Father, to hear and to receive the things that you have for us this morning. Guide us and direct us in all things, teach us in all things, and let your will be done in our lives. And we ask all of this in your son, Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. The title of the message this morning, God, is a higher standard. And like I said, it's taken out of uh, the book of Luke, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 3, and verses 42 through 43. And let's read our portion together. Verse 1 says, In the meantime... When an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that would not be revealed, nor hidden that would not be known. Verse 3, therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And what uh, you have spoken in the ear in inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. Verse 42 says, And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. You know, when I began my professional career back in uh, 1995, 
It was drilled into our training class's mindset at the time on that first day of training in Washington, D.C., that we were going to be accountable and held to a higher standard than that of the general public due to the nature of our job. We were told that our actions and even our very words could be scrutinized if we were ever called upon to explain ourselves before Congress or to testify in a court of law concerning our actions or lack thereof in carrying out our duties. And I'm sure most of you probably have a code of conduct and or rules and regulations you are required to and are expected to follow in your own chosen career. And even if you don't, if you don't work outside, you know, if you just uh, uh, um, a stay at home person within your own home, you probably have certain standards you expect from your spouse, that you expect from your kids, if you have kids, and even from yourself. If we have these so-called higher standards in our secular life and try to adhere to them, as well as expecting other people around us to adhere to these standards, how much more should we operate at a higher standard as believers in Christ? The Bible says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Here in our portion of scripture this morning in the book of Luke, we're going to touch upon three points from our text on how we should be operating at this higher standard as followers of Jesus. Our first point is given to us. In verse 1, it is, as believers, we should try to avoid hypocrisy in our lives. Verse 1 says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, immediately the question is asked, well, what is hypocrisy? And why should we try to avoid this as Christians? I believe it's simply having a form of righteousness when our hearts are far from God. Essentially playing a game with God while appearing all pious before mankind. Jesus addressed this hypocrisy in Matthew 23 when he said, and he was referring to the scribes and the Pharisees, he described them as whitewashed tombs. He said, you guys are beautiful on the outside, but inwardly full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. The scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders of that day, were to be held at a higher standard because of the position that they had. And they should have been carrying out their duties at this higher standard as representatives of God. But they were not. They were misrepresenting the, uh, our God before the people, in their words, in their deeds, and even in their actions. Luke 16, 15 says, And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. I ask you, I ask myself, all of us this morning, uh, we operating at this higher standard as children of God in all that we do, in our words, in our actions, in our deeds? Or are you operating on the level of the scribes and the Pharisees? Looking good on the outside and having a heart that is far from God. The Bible says, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In the book of Ezekiel, it says, 
So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. We as believers, guys, must live at this higher standard to those around us. Not that we will be lifted up. It has nothing to do with us. But that our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, will be lifted up among men as they observe our life, our actions, our deeds, our words. Second Corinthians says, we are, an, we are ambassadors for Christ. Therefore, as Christ's ambassadors, we are representing him here on this earth. We should be letting our light so shine before men that they will see our good works and glorify our God which is in heaven. Somebody put it like this, and I quote, The gospel is written a chapter a day by deeds that you do and words that you say. Men read what you say, whether faithless or true. So what is the gospel according to you? What do, do, what do people see when you, me, we proclaim the name of Christ and we don't live up to it? What do people get from our lives? What are they receiving from our lives as believers in Christ? Are they looking at us and saying, you're no better than I am. You proclaim to be a Christian, but you're doing the same things I do. So what good is your life if you're doing something like that? Our second point this morning is be faithful and wise. Verse 42 says, and the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise servant? Simply stated, it's that person who does the will of the Father, who does the will of God. And generally speaking, what is that will? It's to know God and to show the love of God to those around us. And in effect, to draw people to Christ. That's our whole purpose as believers in Christ. 1 John 3.23 says, And this is his commandment, that we believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Paul put it this way in the book of 1 Corinthians. He said, For I have determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He goes on further to state in the same book in the fourth chapter, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Found faithful in our representation as believers in Christ. Faithful and wise in the things of God and not so much in the things of this world. Does your life as a believer reflect that you are faithful and wise as a follower of Christ in your daily interaction with people, whether it be family members, whether it be friends, whether it be co-workers, or any other associate that you might encounter on a day-to-day -day basis? Or do they know more about where you stand politically, socially, culturally, as it relates to the world standards? Does your will and or desire center upon winning people over to your political or social viewpoint, winning people over to your political party affiliation or candidate, especially during these turbulent times that we find ourselves in today? If so, I would say that you're not being that wise and faithful servant that God wants us to be. Because during these turbulent times, 
people are looking for answers to their questions. The Bible said, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. People are seeking hope in their despair during these turbulent times. The book of Hebrews put it this way, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. People are searching for comfort in the midst of chaos. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. That's what people are searching for during these turbulent times that we're in. And as believers in Christ, we have an excellent opportunity to present the good news of the gospel. And this should be our labor of love for and toward people. Because they're not going to find it in a political party, in a political candidate, in a social movement. They're not going to find it in these things that people are searching for answers during this time frame we're in. Our job as believers is not to try to take over the government or try to get people to come to our side of the political fence. Our job as believers is to win people over to Christ. That's our main job. That's our main purpose in life as believers. The Bible said, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures the everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal upon him. When we stand before God, do you really think he's going to be concerned with what political party you were affiliated with, which candidate you uh, supported or did not support, which social issue you participated in. All that is the food that is perishing. I don't think he's going to be concerned with that. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, our civic duty has its place. There's nothing wrong with political debates and participation, but to what extent and at what cost? Is it worth alienating people? Or is it more important for you to win a political or social debate than to win someone's soul for Christ? God may have brought us to this point in history amidst all the chaos that we are witnesses, wit witnessing for such a time as this. As Mordecai told Esther in the book which bears her name. To stand for him in getting the gospel out to a lost, confused, and dying world. The Old Testament prophet Nahum put it this way in Nahum 1 verse 15, Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. Are you that faithful and wise servant operating at the higher standard to shine the light of salvation, which is Christ, to a lost, confused, and dying world? Notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. He said, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law, to, law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. And to the weak, I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, 
that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partakers of it with you. Becoming all things to all men in accomplishing God's will, winning souls for Christ. This should be our primary goal and desire as believers. John 6 says, And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The missionary John Elliot, Jim Elliot, I'm sorry, put it this way uh, from uh, a bygone era. And I quote, he said, Father, make me a crisis man. Bring those I contact to a decision. Let me not be a milepost on a single road. Make me a fork that men must turn one way or another on facing Christ and me. Are you that person that people are looking at? And what do they see when they see you? Are they seeing Christ in you? Or are they seeing just everything else that the world is offering? Our third and final point is we are to finish well. Verse 43 says, Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. How do we finish well as believers? By simply doing his will and completing his will in our lives, I believe. But we cannot do it or complete it without knowing it. And how do we know it? By knowing his word. It's impossible to know God's will without knowing what the Bible says. Hosea said, my people are perishing, are being destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Dr. J. Vernon McGee used to often state that he was amazed how ignorant some believers were when it came to the knowledge of God's word. See, God is not concerned with what you think is right or what you feel is right, but he is concerned with what you know is right with respect to his word. So increase your knowledge of God's word that you may be able to operate at the higher standard and be able to finish well as believers. Being diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Being ready to preach the word in season and out of season to those around you so that all of us may be able to stand in that last day when we stand before our Savior and proclaim the words that Paul uh, proclaimed in the book of 2 Timothy when he said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Warren, Warren Risp Wispy said, our relationships with others depend on our relationship with the Lord. See, it's impossible to operate at this higher standard among people if you're not operating at the higher standard in your relationship with God. How can you? If you don't know what he's telling you to do or you don't know what his word says, you shoot him from the hip when it comes to the things of God. And how can you be a proper representative of his doing that? Or how can you finish this race well doing that? You can't. It's impossible. It's just common sense. We can't do it. It's no way you can do it. As we conclude today, I'm reminded of something that my mom used to tell my brothers and I when we were young and when we were growing up. She would often say to us, don't embarrass me in public. <laughs> don't bring shame to the family. 
by your words and by your actions. This is an admonition to us as believers today. Don't bring shame or dishonor to the name of Christ by your words, by your actions, by your deeds. To, pro- to try to prove a worldly point to someone. Remember what Nathan said to David when he sinned with Bathsheba. In the book of 2 Samuel, he said, Because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme. Don't let this be said of us as believers in this day and age that we're living in. If you proclaim the title of Christian, which means that we should be Christ-like, operate at this higher standard as believers in glorifying his name, that you may be able to walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Amen, guys? Let's pray. My Father, today, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you, my Father, for the goodness of your word. We want to ask you for forgiveness if we've misrepresented you to our fellow men, my Father, as we've gone through this life. We ask that you create in us a fresh and anew, my Father, a heart a desire, a will to do what you would have us to do, to walk according to your will and according to your ways, my Father, in properly representing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to a lost and dying world, my Father. We don't, know the, we don't have to know everything, my Father, or provide an answer to every question, but we should be able, my Father, to tell people about the hope and the salvation of Christ not only for ourselves, but also for them. So, creating us a clean heart and a right spirit, creating us, my Father, as I said, a desire to do those things that you would have us to do, to walk according to your will and be properly rep- and, and to properly represent you to this world. And we ask all of this and we pray all of this in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen.